Um, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar arranged by SKL International and SOLAR in which we will take you through local perspectives from a country going through its most severe crisis in a very long time and in which local anger with decision makers is immense. My name is Marianne Huguzon and I manage the Restlog project Resilience in Local Governments, which is implemented in Lebanon and Turkey to help municipalities cope with the large influx of refugees fleeing from the war in Syria. Uh, we are so happy that you could join us here today and thank you so much, uh, especially to our speakers who I will be introducing in just a minute. But before that, just a short uh, take on who is Saler and SKL International. Saler is the Swedish Association of the Local Authorities and Region and represents all the municipalities and region in this country. And SKL International is its branch for International Development Corporation. We work across uh, the globe in the different projects and in the MENA region, we are, apart from Reslog, active also in Tunisia and in Iraq. Like most of our projects, Reslog is financed through SIDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. And Reslog in particular is funded through the Swedish regional strategy for the Syria crisis. In Lebanon, the project started three years ago, together with our local partners, the local unions of municipal municipalities, Drebola Auset and Jordal Kaite. And already by that time, challenges were huge, uh, as there was a severe lack of resources, both financial and, and human resources. There was a lack of reliable data. Uh, there was a huge need for capacity development for, for municipality staff, etc. Then came the political revolution and crisis, the financial crisis with hyperinflation. There was already a waste crisis. And as if not all this was enough, uh, then came a global pandemic that accelerated all these crises on top of each other. Um, by the end of last year, we were in a phase where we needed to, to redevelop our project and take stock on what we have experienced and learned already and adapt to the new developments of the context. We had to ask questions such as, is it even possible to work with local municipalities in conditions like these? Can we uh, support them in creating equal services to their vulnerable populations of both Lebanese and Syrians? Can we work with questions such as accountability and transparency? Therefore, we commissioned a senior analyst, uh, Bitte Hammergren, to do a research on Acker as an example and Reslog or Project as background, which resulted in the report that she will be presenting here today. Uh, and then, after this presentation, we have a panel discussion with introductions from Professor Joseph Bahou, who is the director of the Islam Forest Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, who will give us the macro perspectives on the developments of Lebanon today. After that, we trickle down to the local levels, and we have two experts on local governance with us here today, and that is Ms. Mariah Devine, representing UNDP and UN Habitat, and the MERT project, which is Municipal Empowerment and Resilience, and Ms. Soraya Hamoud, who is the local restaurant manager based in Halba in Akkar. And these two projects are quite similar, but quite different, as um, you will hear. Uh, the MERP is rolled out across Lebanon and in larger municipalities, whereas the restaurant project is um, rolled out in Akkar and in very small municipalities. So, thank you, and over to you, Bitte. Thank you so much, Marlene, for this uh, presentation and for opening this discussion. Um, a few words about myself uh, to those of you who don't know me. I have a long background in journalism. I used to be Middle East correspondent of a Swedish daily, Svenska Dagbladet. I've been also the head of the MENA program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And uh, 
and an analyst at the Swedish Defense Research Agency. But nowadays, I'm a freelance. Uh, I feel very humbled to speak in front of this audience because I know there are so many experts and stakeholders there. But I'm also very glad that uh, my presentation will be followed by this panel uh, discussion with three distinguished guests, all based in Lebanon. Uh, before I give a, a presentation of my, um, my, my report, let me say a few words about the challenges uh, of uh, writing it. First of all, uh, the intention was to, uh, let me see, my intention was to make a field visit in Akar in North Lebanon and to conduct interviews on the ground. These plans were put on hold due to the pandemic and ultimately they were canceled. I very much regret that since I know as, from my experience as a journalist, how important it is to be on the ground and to meet people face to face for the deeper understanding. But while writing from a distance, I had tremendous help from the wrestler team in Akar, from Saraya Hamoud and her team members. The second challenge in writing about Lebanon is that it's a moving target, as everybody knows. There are so many rapid changes. And since I filed the report in, in early March, I know that the Lebanese currency has hit new lows, with I think the minimum wage now being, uh, the daily minimum wage being equivalent to $2. That's incredible. And we still have a caretaker government in, in Lebanon. The report is focusing then on a car where SKL is running its wrestler project, uh, cooperating with two unions and municipalities in Drebel, Ausat, and Jur al -Khaite. It's noteworthy that um, Akkar lies much closer to Homs than to Beirut, so there are many links to Syria. It's also one of the poorest regions of uh, Lebanon, hosting refugees, uh, um, with Syrian refugees. And uh, the refugee crisis has put a tremendous pressure on the union of municipalities in Akar to provide housing, services, jobs for host communities, as well as to displaced Syrians. Uh, the municipalities and their unions also suffer from a lack of funding and a lack of staff. They operate within a highly centralized system. Their mandates are not clear to citizens and to local communities. And this happens in a country which is hosting the highest number of refugees per capita in the world, as everybody knows here, with around a quarter of the population being Syrian refugees. In Dreyb, for instance, around half of the population are Syrians. And what was supposed to be a temporary situation has now been going on for a decade with no prospects of a safe return to Syria on the horizon. Akkar is also a typical example of how Syrian refugees tend to settle in Lebanon's poorest regions, which is partly explained by a lower living cost. As highlighted by this map by the UNDP and UN Habitat, Vulnerable areas in Lebanon are more exposed to violence and suffer from heightened insecurity. Meanwhile, the problems in Akkar or any governorate in, in Lebanon are very much linked to Lebanon's crisis as a nation. Uh, in my interviews, Mr. Merheb, head of the Union of Municipalities in Drebel Ausat, said that when Beirut is locked down, people in Akkar lose jobs. But our people don't want to be begging. Our problems won't be resolved until problems in Beirut are resolved. And when the lockdown ends, new problems will appear, such as tensions between Lebanese and Syrians. That's what I'm afraid of. And lately, we have seen some stark reminders of such risks, as when an informal tent camp near Arkal was set ablaze in December. Hundreds of Syrians were forced to flee to temporary shelter after their tents were set on fire. According to reports, youngsters set the tents on fire after a fight broke out between some local Lebanese and some Syrians in the camp. 
a young Syrian researcher, Mohammed El Masri, who took this picture and who uh, used to live in the area and who's also an alumnus from the Swedish Institute uh, uh, Young Leaders Visitors Program, commented after the fire that locals in this district used to stand with the Syrian refugees. But as the situation has deteriorated for the Lebanese, their desperation has grown. The Lebanese population in Akkad is estimated to around 260,000. The number of registered Syrians are well over 100,000. And to that must be added the number of unregistered Syrians. As everyone knows here, the UNHR stopped registering Syrian refugees in Lebanon um, in 2015 upon a request from the government. This shows how controversial the issue is. And the number of Syrians is likely to grow due to childbirths in spite of cases of individual returns, mainly by females and elderly. But most Syrians are likely to stay, waiting for the still unforeseeable day when there will be a political change in Damascus, which may pave the way for international efforts to rebuild Syria. In Lebanon, Syrians are subject to an official no-camp policy. The government refuses to let displaced Syrians settle in official refugee camps. Instead, they live in what's called the informal tent settlements. The situation for those living in tents is, of course, particularly harsh during the winter. Since the situation in Akkad or any governorate cannot be detached from the overall crisis in Lebanon, the report starts with a brief overview of Lebanon's national crisis. And these things are, of course, nothing new for a Lebanese reader, and neither to those of you who are attending here. But still, I find it important to stress that impunity and corruption have become chronic diseases in Lebanon. And the state coffers are empty. Not even the army or the security services have a budget covering the needs of this year, according to the latest reports I read. And people in Lebanon are struggling under at least a triple crisis. There is the political crisis with a political stalemate in Beirut, the corruption, the lack of accountability, the impunity also after the blast in the port of Beirut. And still there is this caretaker government since the explosion in August. As things stand now, Lebanon risks plunging even deeper into crisis. How deep? I leave that to our discussion with uh, Joseph Baut and others. Second problem is the economic meltdown with layoffs and depreciation of the Lebanese pound. And even those still on a payroll have seen their salaries slashed drastically. On the informal market, the Lebanese pound now has lost at least 90% of its value in 18 months. So while the purchasing power of every Lebanese has been shrinking, people are increasingly dependent on remittances for, from abroad for their daily bread and butter. And this is happening in a nation of entrepreneurs, in a country which, by the World Bank standards, used to be classified as an upper middle income country. Uh, and for, the, for, for the, this, the latest forecast, we can see that the economy is expected to fall with another 19%. So nearly half the Lebanese are driven into poverty, and the middle class has eroded, and many are extremely poor. And as mentioned in my report by Suraya Hamoud in the Reslog team in Akkad, the question is now, who has eaten and who has not? But there's also another way to summarize Lebanon's way of handling the crisis. Let me quote Peter Harling, former project director at International Crisis Group. He wrote lately that, None of Lebanon's commercial banks has gone down. Policies protect the shareholders by transfer, transferring the costs of bankruptcy to clients and to society at large. So one can easily understand the anger on the streets. 
The situation is so dire that when I asked about the employment rate in Akhtar, the answer was, it's better who's to ask who is still working and who gets paid. Municipalities, on their hand, have not been paid by the government since 2018. And this, according to Mr. Merhab, head of the union of Drebel Ausat, means that every project in the municipalities has been put on a hold. Mr. Zakaria, who is the head of the Union of Municipalities in Jurt al concluded that the Lebanese nowadays regard Syrians as better off, as they see Syrians supported with credit cards in dollars. Most, if not all, people I interviewed underline that donors must focus on the needs of vulnerable people among both Lebanese and Syrians. Providing assistance to one group while neglecting another may trigger violence, many sources warn. And this is really one of the main takeaways from my report and research. As we know, the pandemic has, has also led to the third crisis in Lebanon uh, with spiking infection curves. And according to figures that I, I gathered yesterday from John Hopkins, only 0.88% of the population are fully vaccinated. Repeated closures have also led to um, high employment rates, of course, and kept children away from school for a year. So the learning gaps um, affect children of all nationalities, whether Syrian or Palestinian or Lebanese. And families complain that teachers are seldom trained in online learning. Moreover, many households are without the internet or lack high-speed services. Mr. Zakaria in Jur al qaeda explained that some households have only one mobile phone, but maybe four to five school children. And with the economic crisis, people cannot afford to buy laptops. And this online, online learning system has then become very tiresome for students, teachers, parents. There is also a gender perspective on the lockdowns with increased risks of child marriages and domestic violence, which is discussed in the report. How then to build resilience, underpin good governance and strengthen vulnerable communities, both Syrians and Lebanese? Well, first of all, Lebanon has its human resources. Among young people, you find ingenuity and a strong wish for change. But as things stand now, Lebanon's risk to losing its young talents in another wave of emigration. According to the Dubai-based Arab Youth Sur Survey, 77% of the Lebanese um, in the age groups between 18 and 24 wish to emigrate. And when I ask young Syrians and Lebanese in Akkad what people in power should prior prioritize, their answers are often identical. Improved education and development projects and ex access to job uh, opportunities and better guidance to the labor market. Syrians, uh, sorry, to the attorney, in Akkar say that they are affected by the decreased funding from the UNHCR and restrictions for Syrians in the labor market. But in a nation of entrepreneurs, it should be uh, discussed whose responsibility it is to create jobs. I leave that for the Q&A. Even though most interviewees describe corruption in Lebanon as a top-down problem, corruption at the local level cannot be neglected. Still, I found that the anger is more oriented towards the political class in Beirut than at the local governments. As reflected in the report, there is a discussion among some donors as to whether they should work only with the civil society organizations in Lebanon, but my findings show that civil society organizations are certainly vital for Lebanon. They've, we have people combating COVID, spreading awareness of how to protect the environment, clearing rubbles after the Beirut blast, 
but also from my findings, the civil society organizations cannot replace local governments. The Lebanese are calling for accountability and this must be provided by elected bodies who can be held accountable. However, there are certainly needs for stronger criteria for transparency and active citizenship. So finally, before addressing our panelists, the RESLOG project funded by CEDA has as its guiding principles the Swedish Regional Syria Strategy and the UN Sustainable Goals. Inclusive institutions at all levels are part of the UN goals. In Sweden, a regional Syria strategy, access to inclusive and equal social services is also stressed. However, I find also that the word inclusion in relation to Syrian refugees in Lebanon triggers strong reactions which goes back to the Palestinian armed struggle during the civil war in Lebanon. We'll talk more about that during the Q&A. But from my interviews, I also found that the pandemic illustrates what a lack of inclusiveness might imply. If Syrians in Lebanon are not included in the vaccination programs, the society at large cannot be safe, as this graph illustrates. And with that, I, I leave the floor to Marlene again. Thank you. Now we'll go to our panelists. Thank yes. you so much, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to, to introduce to you now uh, Mr. Um, Professor Joseph Baut. I think that many of you uh, know uh, Joseph Baut from his previous position as, uh, uh, in the Carnegie Middle East prog uh, program or in the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs or as a professor of Sciences Po in Paris. And Joseph also happens to be a friend of mine. And then I know that your expertise is so good. So I wonder if it's possible for you to describe in a short period of time, how deep the crisis in Lebanon can go before it passes its nadir, its lowest point. And what are the remedies in the short and the medium term? Okay. Thank you so much for all of you for having me and thank you Bitte, for your introduction and for your also the connection you made to this uh, that allowed me to join this this very interesting panel. Um, I think that I mean uh, what you said in, in this uh, very thorough and very exhaustive uh, uh, word of intro and, and this first presentation that you had, you answer part of the question or most of it. Uh, I mean, hearing you, uh, it becomes very obvious that Lebanon is now really uh, very close to this, to this Nadir point that you have mentioned. It's uh, the free fall has started and I don't see frankly, and I think many observers would, would agree with me, that we don't see uh, really the, the end of it, the end of the tunnel. Will uh, some, some could even go as far as saying that we are only at the beginning of the tunnel. Uh, the crisis is, is really a conflated crisis. It is a um, macroeconomic crisis uh, long in the, into the making. It is a financial crisis, as you have described it, that has uh, really exploded uh, two years ago with the complete melting of Lebanese uh, depositors' uh, money in, in the banks. We have something like uh, between 80 billion and 115 billion dollars that have uh, almost evaporated, that are lost today. Um, the central bank has seen its entire reserve uh, depleting uh, up to the level of almost uh, 2 billion or something like that today, which means that the subsidies that allow uh, average people to live, subsidies that support uh, the buying of wheat, of medics, of fuel, of etc., uh, are uh, still enough for only two or three months. So uh, in two or three months from now, the Lebanese society will be completely uh, without any social coverage. Um, the unemployment rates are um, probably very uh, incredible. I'm saying it probably because Lebanon is a country that suffers also for, uh, from a lack of, of figures and statistics. Probably that the real uh, 
unemployment unemployment rate is something like 45 to 50 percent of course poverty has exploded and the, the, the last figures of the world bank uh, are saying that we are nearing something like 70 percent of the population uh, being very close to poverty line uh, i won't get uh, further in the landscape and in the figure and etc because it is really appalling now the second level of the crisis and which make uh, which makes us all believe that uh, probably uh, we're still at the beginning of the tunnel is that the political st structure in the country the political class and the government and the let's say the dominant class even the bankers and the, the central bank governor and etc are uh, not only um, not enough tools for uh, answering this uh, this, this huge challenge, but they are still living in a kind of denial, of state of denial, um, either refuting completely the fact that the crisis is at the level that we are describing, or simply saying that it's a conjunctural crisis and that it will wither away uh, very quickly, and it's uh, it would only take a few uh, a few money from abroad in order to keep the, the country afloat. So. And this is the second level of, of uh, let's say, uh, of crisis. And the third level of crisis, and you alluded to it, but, uh, uh, that was in fact underlined and highlighted by the port explosion, is a kind of moral crisis in a country where uh, any, any attempt, any sign of accountability, any attempt at uh, clarifying things, at shedding light at things, uh, is completely uh, inexistent also. Uh, we are now six months after probably one of the biggest explosions in, in contemporary history uh, that has destroyed part of the city. We still don't have the slightest uh, progress on the inquiry. Uh, no one knows uh, what was there, what exploded, how it exploded, and, and the exact amount of losses. Uh, so this is, this is the picture in the country. Now, um, if I want to answer your question, uh, the scenarios are grim. I mean, either uh, in a few months of now, um, and this is probably the most, uh, the most visible scenario for now, uh, social violence will uh, increase. You can already see signs of it under the form of people attacking banks or attacking or quarreling in supermarkets and these quarrels are evolving into sometimes armed uh, uh, let's say uh, confrontations between people and then groups uh, this social violence could take more political forms uh, in the way in the form of of self security uh, territories that will begin to to shape in the country and this is a remote uh, let's say replica of what uh, the country has lived during the civil war. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the country is maybe plunging into civil war as such, because this needs another level of political decision and regional uh, involvement, of course. Uh, but a kind of diffuse, low-level, uh, permanent violence uh, could uh, take place a, a, a bit in, in the form of what we have seen in, in countries in Latin America a few decades ago. Another scenario is that um, Facing such a uh, such a let's say uh, a complete erosion of order and 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 really social unrest and etc. One of the potent forces in the country could be uh, tempted to make a kind of coup de force or a coup d'état or uh, taking over in order to avoid. Uh, full chaos and the two organized forces, uh, the, the two only organized forces in the country are, uh, of course, Hezbollah on, on one side and the Lebanese army on the other. Uh, this is where the problem could become really uh, explosive and more macro because if there's no agreement between these two forces, uh, any one of them attempting to do something would uh, trigger a confrontation with the other one and with other components in the country and uh, this is where where the country could drift maybe to a, a wider scale confrontation. Now, of course, we don't exclude a, a kind of rosy or more or less rosy exit strategy, but it will take uh, a lot of conditions to be met. Yeah. First of all, it will take, uh, it will uh, really necessitate that the regional conundrum is uh, uh, put on on the way to, to, to solution, meaning that uh, Iranian American negotiations are uh, reopened up that the drift between the Gulf states and, and Iran is mended, uh, that uh, also the new Cold War between the US and Russia 
avoids Lebanon. Uh, it will also take probably uh, some stabilization in Syria and the signals there uh, are not very encouraging with the probable re-election of Bashar al-Assad in two months, uh, which means that the refugee issue will uh, continue to weigh on the Lebanese society. This is the first set of conditions that have to be met. And the second one is that uh, any foreign help, and, and this was the, the, the spirit of the French initiative and before that of the said uh, aid, financial aid package to Lebanon, any foreign aid will have to be uh, accompanied uh, sine qua non, I mean, without any discussion by uh, an entire set of Lebanese uh, deep reforms in terms of public uh, spending, in terms of public finance, in terms of governance, in terms of justice, etc. And uh, everybody is now aware and convinced that this same political class is completely unable uh, to do this. Uh, so both conditions, the regional and the local, are uh, not, not there yet. Even if they are uh, uh, united or there, again, they will take time. And uh, my fear, and I'll close it here, my fear is that the curve or the dynamics or the pace of Lebanon's collapse uh, is going much faster faster than uh, the other dynamics that could uh, unfold and maybe uh, salvage the situation. I'm very sorry to be so bleak, but uh, I think that uh, a quick answer to your question, Bitte, is that uh, we're maybe not yet at the at, at, at the end of the tunnel or at the at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, we're reaching it quickly, uh, but this cliff is uh, is very deep, and probably it will take a long, long time, maybe something like five to ten years, for the country uh, to recover again if things are done and done uh, properly. Oh, thank you so much, Joseph, for this uh, overview, a very rapid uh, overview of such a, a, a grim situation. But I think that it's better for us to be a realistic pessimist uh, uh, rather than to be naive optimist here, because that makes us better tools to, to find, to operate in this situation. We'll get back to you later, Joseph, during the group discussion, but now I'd like to turn over to Maria Duvin, who is the Chief Technical Advisor for the Municipal Empowerment and Resilience Project at the UN. Uh, Maria, um, if, if I turn to you, um, what is your experience from working on That's governance at the sub-national level? Is there a value added to that? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Peter, for your question. Um, yes, yeah, so as you just mentioned, I'm Chief Technical Advisor of the Municipal Empowerment and Resilience Projects, and we're a joint UNDP UN Habitat uh, initiative. Uh, and we're funded by the EU through its uh, regional trust fund in response to uh, the Syrian crisis. Um, so I believe we do have uh, similar objectives and work as, uh, as KL does. Um, so our project uh, aims to strengthen the long-term resilience uh, of uh, local communities, including host communities, refugees, uh, displaced persons affected by the Syrian crises. Uh, but we also focus on strengthening the resilience of uh, subnational authorities in Lebanon. And we do this in uh, three areas in Lebanon, in, um, in the north and the al Faya area, in Metzen and in uh, Tier. And therefore, our project also has uh, quite a strong uh, focus on strengthening uh, local governance uh, processes. Uh, and I do think this is uh, quite interesting because I, I think I, I tend to see that in times of crises, uh, development partners tend to kind of abandon uh, a governance approach. And so um, uh, that the EU and UNDP and UN Habitat support this uh, approach for our project, I, I think is intriguing. Um, but it's also in line with uh, uh, some global trends. So over the last few years, uh, definitely we've seen um, 
um, the importance of linking humanitarian and development programming, for instance, uh, and the need to strengthen local capacity and to avoid uh, setting up parallel systems, including in um, crisis context and, and humanitarian uh, context. So I, I, I think there is a, a kind of a global trend to uh, focus more on governance uh, in these situations and particularly also uh, on local governance. Um, now, as for your question, I, I do think, and also listening to uh, the previous presenter, that many would argue that in Lebanon, um, maybe a focus on governance and local governance now is uh, is less relevant. Uh, but uh, I would still uh, argue on on the country, and, and maybe I'm, I'm a, a bit of a uh, an optimist in, in that sense, but um, I do truly believe that despite the crisis, uh, a, a local governance focus uh, is, is crucial, and I believe that for, for three main reasons. And the first being that uh, municipalities really play a very important role in state society relations and therefore uh, we as development partners should really support municipality and strengthen their role as interlocutor. And I, I think as you outlined in the report in Lebanon, it's not only an issue uh, around social cohesion between groups, but it's also definitely, uh, and it was just highlighted as well, an issue of state state society uh, uh, relationships. And these two factors often um, influence each other as well. What we have found, however, um, if you look, for instance, at ongoing tensions monitoring done by UNEP, this has really shown that uh, while communities often lack trust in, in state institutions at national level, they do still have trust uh, in municipalities. And so from my perspective, I think municipalities are uh, present a key window of opportunity in strengthening state society relations and, and kind of building or rebuilding uh, the state from the bottom up. Uh, and so, yes, we should, we, uh, as development partners, we should take this opportunity and invest in capacity of municipalities uh, to be able to build on that trust and to, to serve their communities. Um, the second reason why I think a governance and a local governance approach uh, is, is also important um, is because I feel it's crucial to strengthen the accountability relationship uh, between municipalities and, and communities. Um, and this is related to the first point that I just mentioned. Uh, but what you sometimes see is that there's, if there's a lot of focus on uh, direct implementation by, by development partners or NGOs, um, this is good, this serves the needs uh, on short term of, of communities, obviously. And, and it, it definitely contributes. Uh, but the danger is also that it can distort accountability relationships between uh, municipalities and, and local government. So communities uh, may see, for instance, that uh, development partners and NGOs and other actors are implementing services, uh, but that municipalities uh, are, are absent and that can, this can further undermine trust in government. And I think this is also something that you saw after um, the Beirut and a lot of people commented, you know, where is the government? Where is the government? There were a lot of NGOs active, but uh, in terms of uh, municipalities being visible, uh, that, that was much less the case. Um, so at the same time, if, if a lot of the services are provided by other, other actors, uh, other than the state. Um, this doesn't also incentivize municipalities uh, to provide services to their communities and to have ownership over projects uh, um, and initiatives. Now, a last point that I want to make uh, in this uh, and, and why governance is uh, governance focus is important, and this is something that you just mentioned uh, as well, Bitta, is that I think we really need to acknowledge the primacy, um, you know, of the state. So, uh, NGOs, development partners, private sector, obviously play a very crucial uh, role in addressing um, uh, community needs, but we can't replace the state in terms of scale and scope 
scope of uh, operations and we can't sustain this on, on a longer term. So if we want to have a scale uh, results and sustainable results, this really needs to be done through the government and we need to support municipalities from my perspective in particular um, to deliver to their communities. Um, and so overall, I would say um, these are the main three reasons why I think um, it is important to keep on having such a, a governance approach in, in, in what we do. Thank you so much, Maria, for sharing this on the ground perspective, which also uh, puts the focus on what we're supposed to discuss more here, the local governance. It, it's very important to hear that, I mean, the, 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 the failure of, in Beirut is not really um, uh, transmitted to uh, the way the, the municipalities function or may function, that there is some capacity to build on here. And from that, I'd like to turn over to, to Soraya Hamoud in, in Akal, who's working then on the ground. And I'd like to hear from you, Soraya, uh, the, the word um, active citizenship is, is really a, a key word in the discussions here. But what would, from your perspective, uh, active citizenship apply if you go to your local community? Hi everyone and thank you Bitte for the introduction and for working on the report. Um, actually, by definition, active citizenship means that people are getting involved in their communities and democracy on all levels. And in our case, we totally believe that everybody live, living in a shared territory is contributing to the economic, environmental and social well-being of that territory regardless of one status. Uh, in our units of municipalities, for instance, we're working equally with both Syrian and Lebanese. I will give an example related to the project, uh, which is related to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We worked with a group of volunteers from different nationalities who supported the unions and the municipalities in the field work and assessment to, spread the, the, to prevent the spread of the virus. This is the case of Salamati intervention under RESLO. Our role in this case was to mobilize the community groups, build some skills and motivation for them to contribute, and then uh, uh, to contribute to a, a concept or a concern that is shared between both local authorities and local communities, and that is uh, a priority need for them by that time. Same example goes for other pieces of the project puzzle, such as GIS component and others. Those are practical examples that shows that the ingredients of the community engagement in municipal work and decision making already exist. We have volunteers, engineers, different community talents already existing. Our role is to be enablers and catalysts and to build people's knowledge, skills, values and motivation to work to make a difference in their communities and their area. Another uh, key concept for active citizenship within RESTLOG is local resilience. We know that local resilience is a group effort. So as much as skills and resources we provide to our community groups, the more they will invest and contribute to the communities and to their municipalities in return. This applies to all the institutional development interventions on the rest of. We focus like on the learning process of engaging local authorities with their resourceful community groups in order to respond to a community-based need or priority. However, local resilience is threatened of differentiation between two equally vulnerable groups. And this is what happened actually after the honeymoon period of the Syrian influx to Akkar. As you may know, at the beginning, we didn't witness tensions and sensitivities between both communities in Akkar, uh, contradictory to other areas such as Bika, for example, in Lebanon, maybe due to common borders, uh, mutual benefits, and intermarriage. It was much easier for a uh, resident of Akkar actually to go shopping or seeking healthcare services in Syria than going to Tripoli or Beirut. However, the organizations who supported Syrians only and left Lebanese equally vulnerable caused reactions and negative coping mechanism. For instance, if uh, the wildfire, for example, reached house, it will affect Lebanese and Syrian houses equally. It will not uh, make any difference between both. If the road infrastructure is bad, it will affect also different nationalities living in this area. However, it may affect more specifically women and children, for example. Therefore, for us, vulnerability has no nationality. 
this photo shows community members with anonymous nationality. No one can tell if this person is Syrian or Lebanese, but they are desperately trying with whatever possible tools they have to save this elderly, elderly three injured the lighter. At the beginning, uh, when we started thinking and reflecting about active citizenship, we started with a focus on citizen participation as a direct intervention of social agents in public activities. This picture shows a Syrian refugee living in Drebel Awsar named Muhammad Juma, and his, some, his kind of a success story that we're proud of, actually. He volunteered to promote touristic landmarks in order to enhance economic development. And this was done in collaboration with the Union of Municipality for as a first time experience for him. So instead of being only like a beneficiary passively receiving or asking for aid and service, he decided to contribute and to be active as a form of engagement with interventions which may affect his life positively, positively on the longer term. And then we totally believe that the needs of Akkar are not yet covered. However, there's a good will, a will of, uh, uh, from different donors actually to support. And here we have the role not to provide direct support, but at least to empower change agents to influence the support in order for it to meet the needs of the citizens living in that area, irrespective of their nationalities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saraya. And I must commend all the panelists, but not only do you have so rich presentations, but you're also expert in sticking to the timetable, which is not always the case, which gives us lots of time for the group discussions. And before we turn over to the Q&A with everybody participating, I'd like to ask our panelists here um, to reflect on, on the issue of inclusion. I mean, Soraya already mentioned many aspects here of how she sees inclusion, but the word itself is controversial, I learned from, from my uh, interviews, as, as one of the experts interviewed was saying that um, the word inclusion must be, be removed from the lexicon of the donor community working to support Syrians in Lebanon. Um, even though this is part of the um, sustainable development goals of the UN. So I, I'd like to turn again to the floor to the panelists and, and ask you to reflect on how you see uh, the issue of inclusion in the Lebanese Syrian perspective. Who wants to go first? Maria, maybe. Okay, yes. Um, I think in the uh, the current uh, yeah in the, in the Lebanon context it's 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 uh, sometimes complicated. We talked about this too as, as part of the report, and I uh, I have uh, experienced similar responses in terms of uh, inclusion. But I, I think it it's often the way it is explained as well. Um, uh, it's almost like it, inclusion has become synonymous to. Uh, just focusing on on Syrians, whereas I think um, uh, I really see it from the broader perspective. Inclusion means everyone, and obviously, from my perspective, uh, um, uh, inclusion is important because it's rice based, and and from a normative uh, perspective, you know, you we cannot leave uh, anyone anyone behind. Um, but there is another way how you can talk about inclusion. Um, and that's more uh, from a practical perspective, I would say. Um, and it's also something that you hinted upon when you talked about COVID-19 and the vaccination schemes. I mean, so many complex problems today uh, require a holistic uh, approach. And it doesn't work if you just focus on one uh, group of, of the population. You really, to address these complex problems, uh, you truly do need uh, an inclusive approach and you can only address these uh, together. Another example would be gender, for instance, or if you want to promote um, the inclusion of women in, in politics, you, need, uh, you can train women, uh, but you also need to include men in that discussion and target both, uh, both groups. So that's kind of a, a, a way how I see this. But maybe it's about uh, changing the narrative uh, a little bit and making it 
more um, positive or in line with what people say. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And Joseph, what are your thoughts on the issue of inclusion? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Bitte. Uh, no, I listened with with a lot of uh, attention to what was said, and I, I'm not exactly a, a, a development specialist. I'm not I'm not uh, working in that field, but I, I would like to shed maybe a few lights, uh, bullet points uh, type of uh, I mean uh, some remarks pertaining to to our subject and the field that we are, uh, or at least that you are studying here. Uh, in terms maybe of, uh, in order to, to widen the picture. Uh, first of all, it's very important to, uh, to understand that we are talking about a, um, a very particular region in Lebanon that has a, a very specific history in terms of, uh, of social and economic, uh, let's say, um, marginalization in the history of Lebanon. This is not new. Akkar is, is probably one of the, if not the poorest region of the country, historically, it has been neglected by the, by the central state or by, by Beirut, if you can say so, because Lebanon is also a very particular country where, uh, I mean, there is a hypertrophy of the capital, an over-concentration over Beirut since the 30s and the 40s, so it's not new. And Akkar has been probably the main, uh, the first victim of this. Uh, Akkar has a history also uh, politically of, of social movements that is very interesting in the country. It's not, uh, it's also old. It is uh, one of the cradles of uh, a kind of peasant, uh, peasant-like left uh, historically in the 60s. The Communist Party was very uh, powerful in Akkar and very well entrenched. You have a high level of education in Akkar, paradoxically, a lot of uh, uh, leftist intellectuals uh, usually, I mean, historically came from Akkar. Then you had uh, it became it became a bastion after the war of the of a kind of Sunni. Uh, I wouldn't say radical identity, but uh, Hariri, uh, let's say Saad, Rafiq Hariri and Saad Hariri had a kind of, of popular reservoir in Akkar for a long time. And this is also a question to be raised in terms of inclusiveness and development. Uh, this did not really lift up the region, in fact, in terms of, of conditions of living, uh, which allowed also uh, in, in a third stage, and this is where probably also the Syrian refugees are now articulated to that, uh, a kind of uh, reservoir of Islamist radical uh, forces in all shades and, and forms. Um, I mean, the, the only clashes that occurred in Lebanon in the 90s, 2000s and after between uh, the central state and Islamist network uh, happened in Akkar and it's not a coincidence. It's, it's a little bit the interland of Tripoli, which is also uh, a very, let's say, um, rebellious city towards Beirut historically. This is one, one very important thing to keep in mind. There's a historical depth here. The second uh, important uh, remark that has to do with what was said before on the municipalities and decentralization and etc. We are in a country where uh, the, the prerogatives in the law of municipalities is really very anemic. It's very, very low. Uh, and it has gone lower after the war because uh, uh, prior to that, the municipalities were raising taxes and, and, uh, and money uh, in, on the local level, putting it back at the Ministry of Interior that was redistributing this money to the municipalities with a kind of, uh, let's say, redistributive uh, 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 mechanism or etc. After the war, and especially some 10 years ago, the Ministry of Interior, because of the Lebanese macroeconomic crisis, has decided not to pay back the municipalities their money. So the, the municipalities are today almost completely without any resource. So. Yes, it's very important to talk about decentralization and municipal level of action and et cetera, but we have to know that these municipalities are completely without any resource and without any, uh, let's say, uh, local power, which is by itself a problem, a structural problem of the governance of the country. Which leads me to the third point and my last point. This is why also it was very interesting and very fascinating to see when the revolution started in October 20, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2019, 
that one of the main features of this popular unrest in Lebanon was that it was very decentralized and this was very rare in Lebanon's history. Uh, the precedents of 205, of 2015 and 16, the, the garbage crisis and etc., were very centralized. This time, there was a kind of decentralized uh, revolution. Uh, first of all, there were movements, protests, uh, uh, road blockings, blockades, etc., in the regions themselves, and a lot of uh, small groupings of the revolution that were rooted in the regions and mainly in Akkar, flooded Beirut and occupied. The, the downtown, which was new. Usually it was a, a kind of Beiruti phenomenon. So this was, I think, a very positive and uh, optimistic, let's say, feature that could have tended, that, would, that could have led us to think that maybe the regions are finally taking their uh, fate in, in, in hand. However, the, the waning away or the withering away of the revolution, and today it's a kind of almost, um, Let's say uh, 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 failure, or, or I mean, or, or I mean, collapse, or end because of COVID, because of many things, is transforming the same local movement into what could be frightening. And I was alluding to it in my presentation, namely a localized violence, a, terror, a territorialized violence, and a movement of self, let's say, security and autonomy and etc. So these may, these same regions that seized the moment in 2019 and uh, tried to participate in the wide movement of transformation of the country, uh, of reform, of protest, and etc. Today are retrenching back to something of a uh, territorialized self-organization, self-security, and uh, so on and so forth. On the background, of course, of what I explained in point one, meaning uh, uh, their history, their social, uh, political, uh, ideological history. This is why now we are really at the at the cross point for these regions, and this is where we can really seriously question today the durability of the central state in the country and its fragility. So all thing has all this has to be taken into account when we approach a, a field like Akkar or a terrain like Akkar, because it has its own. Uh, dynamic historically, and it has a very specific type of dynamic between uh, the territory and the central state. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Sarah, is there anything that you would like to add on the issue of inclusion, or do, do, do you think you mentioned what was needed to say from your perspective already? I no, I think that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I, I thought the question was for me. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no problem. So, <laughs> no, don't there will be more questions to you, uh, Joseph. I was saying to Soraya, uh, if you want uh, to add something here on this. Yeah, I think issue. I, will, I will take it from our project perspective. We believe that uh, inclusiveness, for example, it's nothing to be forced. Uh, it, it has to be natural and organic. So, uh, we're working with different citizens living in the area, regardless of nationality. So we're not shedding the light on, on those differences, let's say, or saying that we're having something focused for Syrian or focused for Lebanese. We're making sure that we're being equally uh, reaching the vulnerable group uh, or the people like, let's call like-minded people or people who have shared concern or shared uh, uh, maybe uh, hope for the future. So we're working on them as active citizens Without any, sh uh, without shedding the light on any differences in terms of nationalities or others, and I think it's working perfectly. Thank you, um, Soraya. Um, I don't see any hands raised or any questions in the chat forum for the Q and A. So you know, <laughs> take your chance here. And while you're thinking about the questions, oh, fine, we're getting one here. Let me just address one final question to anyone in the panel before I hand over to Marlene to moderate the Q&A session. And, and that's about the vaccination campaign. We saw earlier that, that nearly all the vaccinations have been given to Lebanese. Um, but what about what's happening now with the vaccination program? I know that the World Bank, which is financing this, was saying that there will be no WASTA no, no connections uh, to get in order who is to pre 
prioritized in, in the vaccination campaign. But what is actually happening here? Anyone wants to jump on that question? No? Uh, Joseph or, or Maria, do you have any, any, any perspectives on that and, and, and who is getting prioritized now? In Look, uh, so far, I mean, except for uh, probably a marginal number of, uh, you call them WASTA or bypassing of, of the circuit. And uh, I mean, the, the, the main one has been, of course, the scandalous uh, incident of the parliament the members getting vaccined and uh, this made a huge, a huge fuss that, uh, in fact, triggered a harsh answer by the World Bank. Uh, besides that, I think that on, on the vaccination process, um, uh, whereby we can be very severe and harsh with the Lebanese authorities, I think that we have to acknowledge that this is kind of properly handled so far. Uh, of course, with the Lebanese uh, particularities, I mean, it's not completely perfect. But so far, this uh, famous platform, the Minasa, is, is working quite well. Uh, people are registering there. Uh, the, the, the priority is so far given to people above 75 years old. Uh, we're soon approaching the second uh, tier, which is below 75. I think it's next week. Uh, this has to do with the second uh, parameter here, which is the, uh, the number of vaccination or, or vaccines bought by the Lebanese uh, authorities and the private sector, uh, which is low. And it has to do, of course, with the, um, I mean, classical Lebanese uh, procrastination, uh, bad governance, uh, bad way of dealing with things, but it also has to to do with uh, the, the, let's say, the, the, the firms, I mean, the, vac the, the, the pharmaceutical firms themselves who, in fact, devoted a, a small number to Lebanon so far. Uh, now, this is why we, uh, until now, we only have uh, the Pfizer vaccine that is on the market. I think next Monday, AstraZeneca will be on the market for below 75. Uh, private sector is importing uh, the Sputnik uh, vaccine, the Russian vaccine, uh, I think uh, from now till 10 days from now, uh, in huge number, in big numbers. I heard that it is almost something like a million. If you consider that you have to take two batches or two shots, it means that uh, in fact 30% of the country will be vaccinated uh, maybe in a month of now. It's way below what is needed. But I think that compared to uh, countries like Lebanon, not only in the Middle East, but elsewhere in Latin America and elsewhere, or even in France, if, if we have to take a European example, um, the country is not so in, in a bad shape. I mean, of course, it could have been better. Now, what is more alarming than the, the issue of the vaccination is the policy of lockdown and deconfinement that, that is followed by the authorities. And here we have this endless oscillation between total lockdown and a chaotic uh, deconfinement that has to do, and this, uh, I mean, here again, I'm a bit uh, maybe severe with the country and, and with the people in the country. It has more to do with the uh, low level of discipline of people that uh, really don't, uh, in fact, respect the, con the, 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 let's say, the lockdown rules and et cetera probably most of them because of social and economic reasons, because they have to, to earn their living day, day to day. Not, not all of them are uh, income uh, living people. Most of them are living day by day, taxi drivers, uh, grocery stores, uh, small artisans here and there. But this is not helping, of course, to, uh, to, to, to put the society uh, at bay and in security towards the towards the virus, thus the, the high numbers that we have. I mean, this is what I can say, but I'm telling you what you can also uh, read in, in the press. I mean, I'm not, I'm not finding something really new here. Thank you so much. And with these words, I hand over to Marlene to, to moderate the Q&A. So much. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I think the first hand was raised by uh, Lucy Andrade. 
If you want yes. to ask your question, you see. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, yes, well, first uh, of all, uh, I got to say myself, my name is Lucia Andrade and I work at the Embassy of Sweden in Beirut and I work with the support to SKL for also this project, Restlog. Uh, and uh, then I would like to say thank you to Vite for uh, this uh, excellent report. Uh, this is actually uh, captured the attention to my colleagues. Uh, everyone in the embassy was very, is very interested on this report. Unfortunately, these uh, days, uh, it is also the, uh, a lot of sessions of the side events of the Brussels conference for the future of Syria. So my colleagues are all engaged in, in different of these meetings. And in this very moment, uh, we have a bunch of uh, partners from Gaziantep, uh, Syrian organizations that are working from there that are uh, having a, a one of these events. So this is one reason for why my colleagues are not all uh, in this meeting. Um, but I, well, they, they have all the opportunity to read the report, of course. Uh, I have a couple of comments and one question, if I uh, get <laughs> the opportunity. Um, comments first, uh, regarding this um, statement on the, on the donors need to, to approach like the problematic of the Syrian refugees and also the surrounding communities. Uh, I would like to point that from the donors' perspective, uh, uh, at least from the governmental donors, we are very clear in that uh, fact. I mean, there is, I don't think when we meet the, uh, the colleagues from the other embassies of the, from the European Union, I don't think there is one uh, governmental uh, donor that uh, only supports uh, Syrian uh, in, in Lebanon. Uh, all the projects that I know uh, have this approach of uh, the surrounding communities included in any sort of support and as such is also the, the, the support from Sweden uh, to these projects. So uh, I just wanted to, to say that, I think it's relevant. Um, my second point and also regarding that part uh, because was also mentioned that I mean we also have a, a clarity that uh, Lebanon is overcrowded it is a, a, a lot of uh, refugees here and it is a, a very difficult situation for the country especially in, in these crisis times but it's also important to note that there are a, a, scientific studies uh, i can say uh, you can i can invite you all to check if you can find by the uh, internet from the world bank study from the last year that uh, actually confirm that the presence of the refugees in lebanon has not affect the uh, the lebanon uh, economy uh, most of the service that the refugee access are either supported by the United Nations or they are privately acquired. So it is not uh, the Lebanese uh, social services that are being overloaded by the refugees. And uh, on the contrary, there is also in that, in the same study, it is uh, also said that uh, many, in many cases, the, the influx of, uh, of the Syrians have uh, came with uh, some economic uh, support also or some economic growth to certain areas of Lebanon. So this is very interesting. It is nothing that I say by myself. It is in the World Bank report. So I invite you to, to check that. Um, as then I have an also, I, I really appreciate the, the comments on integration and, uh, and uh, inclusion. Uh, it is also a, a um, sensitive point. We understand that. Uh, we work uh, at the Swedish uh, embassy with the uh, with do no harm like uh, for policies and, and, and analysis and we we try to to see like both parts in any kind of intervention we do but uh, we, we understand the sensitiveness of the work here in this context but I would like to say that I, we will I think we will uh, insist in integration and inclusion it is a uh, uh, it is proven uh, that it's a win-win relationship uh, when there is a free influx of immigrants that the integration will develop in in a better situation for both hosting community and the refugee itself. And uh, of course, um, it is not to be, like Soraya said, uh, very well said, that it cannot be by, uh, like forced, but uh, it is important that we donors at least support the in a, in an uh, enabling environment uh, for integration. 
So um, this is important for the Swedish experience too. We know in Sweden we have also a lot of immigrants and we, and we know that integration it, it is a, a, like a key uh, word to, to, for development. And uh, yeah, there were my comments. And finally, like more my, my question or my, my request for a, a bit of extending a little bit the idea from, from, uh, from Vite, especially, uh, is about uh, what I read in the report regarding uh, this different approach uh, towards uh, top corruption or national corruption, if you want to call it like this, and the local corruption. Because when I read, I was like, I, I got the feeling a little bit that the local corruption was not the same dangerous and actually for us in our analysis like corruption is corruption and it's a, uh, the same it's a big problem and it's a bit a big, a big uh, limitation for development so I would like to to hear a little bit more about this approach of the local corruption in the area so uh, thank you very much and that's over <laughs> Right, so um, who should be answering and commenting on, on this? I think that would be um, interesting to hear from, from uh, all speakers actually, uh, because there are different perspectives on, on the comments and questions, I think. Um, would we want to start with uh, Suraya? Uh, yeah, um, let's. I will comment on the integration part and how uh, this will bring benefits for both Lebanese host communities and Syrian refugees. I think this is exactly how we're doing things in terms of um, like we're give, giving a common reason for them to uh, communicate positively, to have something to share, to have. Are you talking to me, Mr. Rosa? Ah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, what, uh, what I want to say here is it's about our project in our unions of municipalities. So, for example, I will take one specific example about Syrian refugees. If we're talking about integration, let's say, we don't at, at the beginning have data related to Syrian refugees uh, in terms of population, for example, what they have in need. And whenever we discuss their priorities, it's about uh, assumptions, let's say. They have X and Y and Z priorities. However, what we're doing here is is also about Lebanese, the same lack of data. So what we're doing here, let's consider having a, a more accurate data or municipal data related to the municipalities we're working in. We're making benefit of the uh, like shared concern and shared priority to both to know about the needs and the priorities and how to approach donors agencies through, let's say, Syrians collecting data related to Syrians and Lebanese collecting data related to Lebanese, all together, let's say, mobilized under the Union of Municipalities. Uh, same goes for any other kind of priorities. For example, the wildfire, we equipped a first responder team that has both Lebanese and Syrian to respond to different emergencies within their contacts and their municipalities and their neighbors. So uh, what I wanted to add as well is that we don't force people to do it by telling them you should be like in one place together, but we make them uh, go with the flow of experiencing this together and learning the importance on both host communities and refugees, hoping that this integration or inclusiveness in dialogue between both should be sustained beyond our project scopes. Thank you, Suraya. I would, uh, would like to hear from, our, from Araya as well how um what was your take on on lucy's comments on um on integration as uh, as such integration inclusion but also okay. perhaps on um corruption in regards to local level and national level respectively okay um well the the point that kind of stuck out to me was uh, the first point in terms of all donors uh, kind of focusing on on um, on all groups and not particularly on on Syrians and that this is uh, you know the approach of of, of all donors basically and I, I do agree with that uh, but I, I think from from for instance from my perspective on on the project that I lead in our uh, in our aim it's uh, explicitly mentioned that we uh, support you know the different groups host communities refugees displaced 
displaced uh, persons. And then it says affected by the Syrian crises. So as soon as you say that, <laughs> uh, sometimes, particularly now with all these new crises uh, having, having occurred, um, you know, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard uh, for counterparts or for communities uh, to, to understand that holistic view because they see that word Syrian crisis. So it's, I think it, it's a, um, um, as I earlier mentioned, it's, I, I really think it's a, a way of communication um, as well that, that is important uh, when we talk uh, about inclusion and our work as development partners uh, in that sense, and perhaps rephrase it. And, and what I do uh, when I speak to uh, counterparts or, uh, uh, and, and you know, discuss our projects, uh, I say, we aim to strengthen resilience in face of crises. And um, that, you know, it's originally our project was designed for the Syrian crisis, but if you strengthen resilience, then the idea behind that is that you, are resilient for our other challenges as well. And so um, that's one way of how I try to uh, address it, but it's, but it's still a challenge. So that's my comment. And then there was a direct question to, to Bitta. Thank you, Mariah. Uh, and there was a direct question to Bitta in regards to, um, in your research, what you could tell about uh, local versus national corruption. Well, since I have, didn't have the chance to, to travel to Lebanon this time, I was re, um, had to rely on phone interviews or Zoom interviews. And I really think that that's, it's, I know it's a drawback, but as you can read from my report, there are ample examples of, of um, um, alleged corruption in, in elections, for instance, with the, the way that uh, there are voting lists and, and allegations of how you can, uh, by votes um, and that big families may take advantage of outdated uh, uh, voting lists. And um, I also hear um, stories about bribes uh, uh, used in before the elections because it's easy if, if someone is offered a prepaid card with up to $100. Uh, in the situation now with the downslide of the economy, who could resist? that and there are other stories that I didn't have the space to, to write in the report about um, families who maybe want to add an extra floor on their um, buildings to, to buy a, an apartment for a son who gets married. If they are with the local administration they might have it easier to get um, the, the permission to do so. Uh, however, it's also interesting to see that in the demonstrations uh, that have been during the protest movement, my take is that there actually, yes, there were some uh, demonstrations um, uh, directed against uh, local governments, but I mean, the core problem is the national disorder or the fail, the dysfunctional state which uh, Joseph has described so well. Um, but if I would have had the chance to travel to Akar, maybe I would have a more refined description of the problem. Thank you. I thank you. So, I mean, this is a huge, uh, these are huge questions that we would love to uh, dig into for long, uh, long hours. But uh, we have other questions, but just maybe to clarify that I think in the report, it, we don't say that, you know, there are a larger or less um, corruption at the local level. However, the anger uh, is more directed to the national level, I think, and, and people think that, you know, it originates from the top level and trickles down. Uh, Noura Hassim has raised her hand. Just a second. Hello, hello Marlene, hello everyone. <laughs> How are you? Uh, my name is Noura Hazim. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working uh, uh, deployed by UNICEF uh, in the local development office uh, in our car governorate. And uh, I would like to uh, to give you our picture or our opinion because we are in close co collaboration and 
cooperation with the municipality there. So, um, as you know, Akkar is the poorest area in Lebanon, and even you can uh, you can say that the, it was forgotten by the Lebanese state, as we said. Uh, are you hearing me, Marlene? Yes, I am. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and after working close uh, to the governor and in the governorate, so I found that. that uh, the state uh, represented by the governor is trying to do uh, the best to the community, even uh, Syrian or Lebanese community. Because if we're talking about this entity in, uh, in the governorate, directly you have integration. Because all the uh, uh, state entities represented, for example, by all the facilities in the, in the Lebanese government, um, uh, can uh, can be benefited by by Lebanese or the Syrian communities, and uh, actually our crisis, our currently crisis, showed clearly the state weakness solving our problems. And uh, I would like to to focus uh, more on the role of municipalities during this crisis. Uh, if we want to to start from the uh, the economic crisis and uh, to the pandemic. Because uh, we have the DRM unit in the governorate, the disaster risk management, and we are working on the pandemic uh, uh, cases, uh, COVID-19, with the municipalities. So uh, these municipalities actually have like the, uh, they have burden on their shoulders, and uh, we are trying to to support them in in many ways. But uh, currently, you all know that we have. Uh, a, a low resources uh, in the municipalities and they have too much to do really so i want to focus and to to um, actually to, to give you our picture in the in akar uh, mainly because you know the, uh, the 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 capacities of the municipalities there and how they can work but today they have uh, too much work to do uh, other than the, the past days. Uh, actually, now we are uh, also working with them with the vaccination campaign and uh, with the registration for, for the new cases. Uh, actually, in Akkar, we have only 4% of the population in Akkar registered in the, uh, in the impact, um, in the COVAX impact, and you know the, uh, the application. Uh, so uh, I would like to to um, uh, to uh, I, how to say it to to focus to focus on the role of these municipalities and how we can uh, uh, we can have all our our um, our hands together to see what we can do if we can uh, if we can support uh, them in. Um, um, I know that you have your projects, uh, your uh, your campaign. So, but my recommendation um, is uh, to focus on how to, to support them uh, in any ways. I'm not, I'm not saying that like financial uh, ways. Um, we need in the community, we need the awareness. So we need the, uh, we need, as I said, the registration, everything. So uh, I know as SKL uh, and uh, I'm in close co uh, collaboration with Suraya that uh, we have um, a lot uh, of uh, governance uh, uh, project, but, uh, but now uh, we are uh, in uh, really in deep need for, for, more, uh, for more focus on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noura. Um, I think we are getting close to, to end time, but perhaps if we, if there's anyone from, uh, from the audience that would like to comment, on uh, what Nora said or or uh, Lucy's comment as well. I mean, we can open for like a short discussion. Or if there is any more questions. There's a question from Erwin. Erwin. Hi. Yes, please. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Erwin from Reslock Turkey. Thank you, Marlen, for organizing this event. It's like, yeah, very instructive. And I have a question for Surya actually. 
uh, of course, on active citizenship. This is some, an issue that we are also working here nowadays in Turkey. And I wonder if you managed to involve refugees to your active citizenship projects, actually. And if you do, like, can you give us some lessons learned? Like, for instance, what were the key challenges and how you overcome them? Yes, thank you, Evan. Uh, I want to like quickly go over what Nora just said about the changed priorities and the additional burdens on the municipalities. Uh, Nora, I cannot say more than what you described about the burden on the municipalities currently. That's why um, within the project uh, we're focusing on how we can be realistic in assisting our unions of municipalities, even if it's not known financially, maybe in processes that will help them uh, deal with their lack of resources that they have, maybe more efficient systems systems to use that require less than human resources, or how can we link them to the human resources in terms of active citizens within, within their areas that can fill uh, the gap of uh, uh, those uh, uh, like needed talents or experiences. So, and this is something that we can definitely talk after uh, the webinar. Uh, Evan, uh, related to uh, being able to include refugees within our active citizenship, yes, we did. I think the biggest lessons learned uh, was the entry point in you know, how to choose a non-sensitive entry point. And for us, our big, big like success was Salamati because everyone needed to, uh, to survive the pandemic in a way or another. So there's no space for sensitivities, let's say, between Syrian community and Lebanese community, or there's less, much less sensitivity between local authorities and Syrian refugees. So it was a very good entry point and momentum that we've built on and we made sure that we're keeping them engaged. So it's not a matter that we're passively, let's say, or we did one time training session and we left. They are now engaged under the RESLOC project with almost all over uh, the project. So in different activities and different forms, they have our priorities whenever we have capacity building or any opportunities to share. We have good success stories about people getting jobs out after their volunteering on the rest log, about people uh, winning, let's say, prizes in competitions. So we make sure, we make sure that uh, we're dealing with them as a long-term network for the union and the municipalities to benefit from way, be, way beyond the project span. Uh, and this is what somehow currently we have, let's say I mentioned the first responder team, it's now formalized under the union, having Syrian refugees on board as formalized personnel, having uh, formal ideas uh, signed and stamped by the union, for example. And this was maybe one because of the entry point and the cause they were all together in it. And then how the process and learning process we went through with our partners, not like to force, you should have Syrian refugees, but however, see the importance of having Syrian refugees among the first responder team, for example. And this is how we, we, we reached here, I think. Right. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I just wanted to hear if there is perhaps any comment from, from Mr. Merhab or Mr. Zacharias, we're talking about the local authorities in Lebanon, to, to uh, of course, the floor, the floor is yours. <laughs> I was waiting for you. Hi, Marlene, how are you? Thank you, it's so good to uh, see you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's say uh, I was hearing all the discussion happening I have to put my uh, on my opinion regarding municipality as I present uh, the municipality maybe in here I'm the only one here probably uh, actually we're not focusing on Syrian anymore because we became as a refugee in our country as a Lebanese we're not just now we're like uh, the Syrian now have their own sources of income. But now Lebanese, they would consider as the poorest people, that's what we consider anymore now. Our job now to do like every, every day supporting Lebanese, that got as the poorest than ever before. We became as a refugee in our country, especially in this area in Akar. Because you know, everybody was working Beirut and Juni and everywhere, restaurant and all the 
uh, in, in the capital. But now, after the uh, port uh, explosion, and everybody back, even the Syrian back, they used to work in Beirut, everybody there. Now, they are back here, no more work, no more restaurant open, no more uh, tourist trip, nobody, nothing. So we become a big, big, big problem now. And as a municipality, as everybody spoke, maybe this was Joseph spoke, maybe was Ray spoke, uh, Ms. Hazim spoke, we haven't got paid for the last two years, since 2019, 2020, we haven't got paid. Like we're working for, with no resources, with no resources. That's what I say, with no resources, mean no resources. And you know, with all this problem on our head, like we become, we, we frustrated now. We don't, what are we going to do? That, that's a big problem for us. And how are we gonna handle situation like this? How are we gonna help people? How are we gonna, because like, like I say, if we're gonna take as a COVID-19, uh, like w w this is the biggest problem too for us. Numbers going up and up and up. And if you wanna transport like a, a, a patient to hospital or something, now we don't have gasoline to, to, uh, to have in our vehicle or our ambulance. That's a problem. Now, most of the gas stations, they have no diesel, no gas, no tanking, nothing. So, and, uh, you know, as, and our, our uh, value of uh, our lira, lira pound, uh, it, it went down, like no more value for it. So it's, it's a crisis. It worker, I've never seen it before. Like I'm 50 year, one year old, I've never seen it before. Which I was living outside the country, but, but never seen it, never seen it. So, I don't know if you can still hear me or? Yes, we can hear you. So, I, I don't know, a situation, it's not like you can think if we can, uh, we consider as we are in big, a huge cliff down, like in, in, in big hole, like, you know what I mean? Uh, it, we, we, we not, uh, we stop thinking anymore, what we gonna do? Because there's no clear view, we can see a problem gonna be resolved in like one month, two months, three months, four months. No, but we can see it like a big, big hole now. We back down and all. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe talking negative, but uh, you can hold and hold and hold. But we we facing the situation more than uh, the government because we facing people here daily, dealing with the people face to face. It's not like uh, they have in the capital, they say whatever policy or something, but they don't, they're not living with the people. We live in the, with the people. We're facing it every day with everything, with, the, with their uh, sores, everything. So I don't know what to say anymore. Like, you know, like, like it's 10 years now, let's just say about refugees. They are integrated already in, uh, in Lebanon here. You know, it's not, especially in our car, like we have no problem. They live in, but there's 10 years now and they still li live in the camp. Camp with the shelter at the, at the, at the, at the tent. A tent Mahab, with the, think, all uh, the wind, all the, we need to round all, up all yes. everything. That's what I mean. Yes. It, it is a very, I, I feel sorry about them too. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, 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 I feel sorry about them. Like still 10 years now, let's say, okay, they're getting uh, financial, but, but they're still living in a bad situation. Thank you, Mr. Like Mohab. I think we need to uh, start rounding up the, the session. If you want to make like a concluding okay. um, remark, perhaps. Sure, no problem. No problem. Thank you so much for your input. I mean, that, that's most uh, valuable. As you know, you're the ones we're actually talking most about uh, <laughs> here today. And uh, I, I will give some uh, concluding remarks before I let you all go up because it's really late, especially you in, in your part of the world. And I mean, um, did I get the answer to my questions in, in um, when I asked for in this report and, and this webinar? I mean, yes and uh, no. It was or yes. Uh, it was a confirmation on 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 the path we were already on, I think, and what we're grasping both uh, in our projects in in Turkey and in Lebanon that uh, the situation is truly dire. Uh, definitely a lot more so in 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 Lebanon. 
uh, and we haven't seen the end of it yet. And how then to work with, uh, as we've been saying, like inclusion of the, the Syrian refugees and along with the vulnerable Lebanese. Um, and I think I got uh, even more in-depth confirmation that we need to continue supporting the, the local level, as, as Maria really put it, that, you know, we cannot omit the state level, there needs to be someone accountable. And I mean, the local authorities are a lot closer to their to the population, both refugees and the local population. And there needs to be some kind of trust so that people can actually start uh, working um, with and support their local authorities, as well as demanding their accountability. And I mean, that we've seen in Westlog, and I think you've also seen that in, in other projects all over Lebanon, there, there are huge potentials in, in the population of Lebanon. You know, it's very resourceful, it's very active. Uh, there is solidarity uh, blooming, um, even when the most poor, in the most poor situation. We've seen that in, um, in Akka, it's possible to work with um, things that truly matters and then it does for the people living there. And then it doesn't matter if you're Lebanese and, or if you're Syrian. Um, but otherwise, as uh, we talked about the enabling environment um, for inclusion or integration, that has changed since um, uh, Escale International came to Lebanon. And, um, you know, there are no more resources for these local authorities to work and support the refugees in the country as they don't have resources to support, uh, you know, the local population that lived there before. So it is a matter, as some people also stressed here, that how you communicate inclusion, that's really important. And we've seen that also, also in Turkey, where we've really stressed um, uh, the uh, word resilience, that you know, there is a multi-layered crisis, then you work with multi-layered resilience. So, um, and you know, to, to be able to ensure and communicate that we all need to work together to be resilient. Um, this has worked for us so far. I mean, I think that that's the part that we need to go and to, to you know, to work to merge uh, the resources that we have, which is our, which are the local authorities that we work with and, and their constituency, be, be it uh, local um, people or refugees. Um, thank you very much for being here, and I think the you know the the abundant expertise in this virtual room uh, is huge, and uh, it would be so fantastic to continue the discussion. But um, and I hope we can do so, uh, working working going forward. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, and thanks to our panelists and speakers.